It's good to see all of you here tonight. We appreciate your presence. And, uh, you know, when I, I don't remember if it was a Facebook message or uh, an email <clears throat> that I received from Andy, and he asked me if I'd be willing to take uh, tonight's lesson, and I responded, you know, certainly I'd be honored to do so. And um, then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, boy, this is going to be hard. And uh, I've, you know, I've, I've thought about the, the lesson itself is not the hard part, and um, the, the hard part is right now. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of emotions that, um, and this is why it's hard, that are still r raw with our family. And uh, this church and school and... Um, the Ohio Valley uh, meant a lot to my dad. He spent his life here, and uh, I'm going to preach. <laughs> I, I can't uh, go through some of the things. It's just too a little too close to share some personal things, but uh, we were blessed. Um, and I will say this, that whatever m my dad was, or whatever he accomplished in life, um, he didn't do it alone. And I, I hope you know that, that uh, my mom was just as much a part of that as he was. Enough of that. Can't, can't go there yet, but uh, let's, let's get into the lesson. <clears throat> there are two words. I, I'm big on themes. I like... Um, I like to talk about, and, and at least just in a broad perspective, to get our arms around this big book called the Bible, I like to be able to um, be able to say, you know, the book of Habakkuk, what's that about? You know, I, I imagine some people would say, oh, I, I don't know. Or the book of Nahum, what, what's that a book about? I, I don't know. But if you could just say, well, it's about this, wouldn't that help you to get your arms around Scripture a whole lot better? And if I were to say the book of Job, give me a word what that book is about. I would say two things. I would say it's about patience and it's about suffering. And it's interesting that the word patience is never once mentioned in the book of Job. And the word suffering is only mentioned once in the book of Job, yet it's on every page of the book of Job. Both of those concepts are on every page. And I want us to talk uh, this evening about the patience of Job. That expression comes from not the book of Job, but the book of James, James chapter 5 and verse 11. And if we back up to verse 10, it says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as an example of suffering and patience, indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I really appreciate that passage, and I'm glad that God saw fit by inspiration to share that with me. Because if you would look at the book of Job, you see suffering, and you don't see... like. Is there a plan to this? You know, that's what Job wanted to know. You know, what, what is going on here? A and now I know there was an intended end that God had in mind that was consistent with his compassion and mercy. And Job was blessed by the time you get to the end. I'm glad to know that what everything happened wasn't just random, that it was God. Uh, his hand of providence was involved in it, and that helps me. But now, here's a thing that sometimes people can re Job, patient? Are you kidding me? Have you not read his, his questions and his doubts? Uh, he said, I need a mediator. Th this isn't right. I need someone who will go between me and God because we have an issue. Patience of Job? That doesn't sound patient. Um, and, and Job chapter 3, he says, I just wish I were dead. I, I don't like this. And, and he complained, and, and he was so intent on justifying himself before his friends, he failed to justify God. He doesn't sound what 
the world thinks is patient, but I think the problem is that maybe we have a wrong or an incorrect understanding of the term patience. What I think people think of when they think of the word patience is a, a very quiet person that has no complaints who endures. But the quietness isn't a part of it. Um, Job had a lot to say, but he endured. The, the Greek word from which we get the word patient is actually a compound word, and it means literally to abide under. You live under, you know, there's a heavy burden that you bear up under. It's not that you bear up quietly and you don't have any bad thoughts or don't have any questions and, and your, your lips are zipped. It, that's not part of the term. It just means that a heavy load has been placed on you and you have seen it through to the end. You have endured. And with that understanding of the word, I understand why Job is said to have been a man of patience. The patience of Job, because it's talking about endurance. In fact, in that same passage in James chapter 5 and verse 11, he says, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. That, that word for endure is the same as patience in that same verse just a little bit later. The New King James says perseverance. It's the person who hangs on and, and doesn't give up and doesn't give in. That person is, is patient. And I want us to look at the patience of Job this evening. And I think there are some things that will help. We'll, we'll see some ways in which he was patient. And then I want us to look and, and transition and see what, what can we do to be like him. Haven't we all seen people that have begun? Well, listen, I, I dare say there are people, there are pews that are empty today that used to be filled by someone else who are no longer patient, no longer enduring. They, they've turned, they've walked away, they haven't finished. And that can happen. So how do I keep that from happening? We'll talk about that as well. Let's begin right here. You know, it, it, it was February of 1942. Albert Francis George Joseph and Madison Sullivan were all drafted into the Army, well, into the Navy. And they were all assigned to the same ship, the USS Juno. And I mean, if you're going to go to the Army, it would be pretty neat to be able to serve on the same ship as your brothers. You know, you're not all by yourself. You've got family there, and, and that would have surely helped pass the time and the circumstances that were difficult. But it was only nine months later, after these men were assigned to this ship, that a Japanese submarine torpedoed that ship and it sank. And ten days later, or excuse me, eight days later, there were ten survivors who were found still floating in those shark-infested waters, none of whom were the Sullivan brothers. Every one of them, all seven sons, lost their lives in that submarine attack. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have had that knock on your door that day and a man in uniform dressed to come in to tell you that not one, not two, not even three, but all seven of your sons have died. It was because of what happened on that day during World War II that the Navy actually changed its regulations. They won't let brothers serve like that on the same ship because something like this could be repeated. But I think about how drastic and how horrific that would be to Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan. And I bring up that example because I don't know what it is about us, but we sin, seem to, I can read of a story in the Bible and it doesn't have the same emotional punch that something that happens closer to our time has. I don't know why that is, but it seems to be the case. Um, but, but that's the framework for the book of Job. Because in Job chapter 1, 
what we have happening is similar but worse than what happened to the Sullivan family. Job was a wealthy man. He had a lot of, of things, a lot of possessions, and he had a big family. He had seven sons and three daughters. And in chapter 1, he gets a knock on the door. It's one of his servants. And his servant comes in and says, Job, um, all of our oxen and all of our donkeys have been stolen. And the men have all been killed. All your sir, I alone survive. They've taken everything. And as he is speaking, another knock on the door. And another servant comes in and he says, listen, the sheep uh, that you have, they were all killed. And even the servants, uh, there was fire from heaven, killed them all. I alone survived. And as he is still talking, another knock on the door. And a servant comes in and says, the camels have been taken by the Chaldeans and all your servants have been killed. I alone escape with my life. And I'm here to tell you what happened. And as he was speaking, another knock on the door. And a man comes in, a servant, and he says, your sons and daughters were all in the house. And a great wind came and it blew the house down. And there were no survivors. All ten of your children are dead. And I alone survived. I can't even imagine that. I don't know how to get my arms around that. You know, if you talk about those, that Sullivan family 40 or, or in the 1940s, that's bad, but they didn't lose as much as Job did. I've never heard of anyone losing as much as Job lost that day. That's the framework for the book of Job. How many of you would want to give up? How many of you would wish you were dead? How many of you would just like the pain to stop? Just, just let me die so the pain would stop. Would we not be in that mode? How angry, how hurt, how scared, how horrified would you be if this kind of news came to your house? Well, this is what makes Job such a special man. And this is why we read about him in the Bible, because he faced that, and he did so with patience, with endurance. And I want you to see some things about Job, in, uh, uh, characteristics of his patience, some things that, that his patience or ways in which his patience manifested itself. And the first thing is that if you turn in your book Bibles to Job and, and look at Job chapter 1 and verse 20, uh, the very first thing that Job did when he learned of this great loss, Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He didn't fall to the ground and curse God. He didn't fall to the ground and say, why me? He didn't fall to the ground and say, how can you allow this to happen to me? He worshiped. I find a, a tremendous quality in the book of Job and his character by that being his first reaction. You can't fake that. That's who he was inside and out. You know, there, we, we sing a song in, in our song, but where could I go but to the Lord? H have you sung that song? You know what I'm talking I can't quote it all. I won't get it right. But that, that phrase, where could I go but to the Lord? Have you ever found yourself in, in situations that were so painful, so confusing, so overwhelming that you feel like, well, where could I go but to the Lord? That was Job. When he faced insurmountable odds, devastating life changes, he was on his face worshiping God. You know, Jesus asked his disciples on one occasion in John chapter 6, he was preaching and he had said some pretty hard things. 
And because of the hard things he said, some of the disciples decided no longer to follow him. They said, man, uh, and they just walked away because they didn't like what he had to say. It was hard. And so Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, hey, uh, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter responded. And he said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Job recognized that same truth in God. What was he to do? To whom would he go to find comfort? How can a mortal give him assurance and calm his, his soul in a moment like this? There's no way. But God can. He had patience, and that patience was demonstrated by the first reaction was to go worship God. He was going to endure this. You know, David, when he lost his son, he fasted, he prayed that that son survived. And when that son died, all his servants were afraid to tell him. And finally, he, he picked up on some things, heard the whispering, and he said, hey, what's going on? And they said, we hate to tell you, but your son just died. They thought he'd fall apart. Instead, he got up, he changed his clothes, he washed himself, and he went and worshipped. And they were stunned by that. And they said, what, what is this? When he was alive, you fasted and you prayed and, and you tore your clothes. And, and, and now that he's dead, you, you get all dressed up and fixed up. And you, you remember what he said. I, I can't bring him back to me, but I can go to where he is. And that's the attitude of endurance. Nothing is going to deter me from finishing this course. Job has faced a blow that I can Job has faced a blow that I cannot imagine, but it wasn't going to shake him off his course. Here's a second manifestation of his patience. He endured when his family was unwilling to endure. All he has left is his wife. His children are all gone. And as he not only lost his children, but now as time passes, Satan is allowed to touch his flesh, and he's just a mess. I mean, it's a pathetic scene of just sitting kind of in a junkyard where the broken stuff is just discarded, and he's sitting there and just scraping the wounds that were oozing, a, a grotesque scene from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And his wife looks at him and says, Job, just curse God and die and be done with it. No support, no help. But he stayed faithful. He said, you talk as one of the foolish women. He was not about to turn his back on God. He was not about to be deterred. Even if it cost him his life, he was not going to be deterred. And I wonder... How many people had that kind of faith? You know, I went to visit a couple a number of years ago, and separately. And, and I went to uh, the, the lady of the house w with another uh, person, and we visited her. And she said, listen, I, I, they, they had been unfaithful. And she said, I'd come back. Uh, I, I'm just waiting on him. If he'll come back, I'll come back too. I, I'm okay with coming back. And so we were encouraged by that. But then we went to visit him. And you know what he said? The very same thing. If she'd come back, we'd come back too. We, you know, we'll, we'll come back and get our life right. How many people are led astray because of a spouse who is uncommitted and, and their, their goal is different in life. And they have the pull and the tug. And, and here I am trying to go this direction. And because of this person and their resistance, I end up making compromises. And, and pretty soon, I've lost my way. If there was ever a reason, and I, I want to say this carefully, because I don't, I don't encourage people to marry Christians. I encourage people to marry people who love God more than themselves. You see, I know some Christians I wouldn't want my children to marry 
um, oh, they've obeyed the gospel, they've been baptized, but they're carnal, they're worldly, they're weak. I don't say marry Christians. I encourage people to marry someone who loves God more than life itself. And that's the way you can help secure and help you to endure. I don't know what it's like to be married and have someone pulling against me the whole time. I know a friend that uh, married a person who was not a Christian, and I know sometimes that works out and you convert them, and, and God bless you if that's your story. But also understand that you're the exception to the rule if that's your story. It doesn't typically work out that way. And I know a lady who said, you know, I, I love my husband dearly. But if I had to do it again, I would not marry a non-Christian. You cannot know how hard it has been. We need to have a companion in life that will help us to endure, not make it harder. Job was unfortunate in this respect, but it did not deter him. I'm going to finish the patience of Job. Even when his family was unwilling, he said, I'm going to do it. Here's another thing. A manifestation of his patience is that he endured, well, I don't know what else to call it, the clumsiness of his friends. If you look at Job chapter 2 and verse 13, I I want you to see something because it it reflects upon the character of the men who he has this debate and discussion with throughout the remainder of the book. They sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his grief was very great they came because they loved job and they saw uh, he was just overwhelmed and they didn't have answers there's no trite comment to be made. Well, in the school of preaching, oftentimes in preacher and his work class, the guys will say, what do you say when you go to a funeral? What do you say when someone has lost a loved one? And I tell them, and it's hard to understand until you just, you don't have to say anything. Just be there. Just let the person know you love them. And I'll tell you, saying I'm sorry is a whole lot more honest than saying, I understand um, just how you feel. Because we don't. Everybody's different. And, And these men have come to Job's aid, and they don't have words. There's nothing that can fix this, but they sit with him. They pass the time. They show that they're supremely interested in him. They came to help. But what clumsy helpers they were. When they began to open their mouth and, and began to try to figure out the, 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 what's behind this course of events, man, they, they started accusing him of ungodliness and, and being an unjust person and unrighteous and not caring about other people. And, and as much as hard as this, losing 10 children, one of his friends has the nerve to say, You've sinned so bad, you still haven't been repaid enough. It doesn't pay for what you've done. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't even come close to paying for it. That's got to be hurtful. That's enough to make a person quit, but not Job. The patience of Job. He was not about to stop enduring How many times have you had somebody or known of somebody who used to go to church, but they got their feelings hurt and they quit? Happens all the time, but not with Job. He endured the clumsiness of his friends. You know, a few years ago, I was at the office working. My my son was probably 12 years old at the time my youngest son, and he was going to mow for me. And uh, he called me up and he said, Dad, the mower won't start. I was at work in the office. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, 
I poured the wrong gasoline. You know, see, we have one that has a mix, you know, the oil mixture, and then the other one doesn't. He said, I poured the wrong gasoline in it, and it, it won't start. Now, before I go further, for the men here, I know it can be fixed, okay? I know what goes through your mind. Well, you can fix that. If you'll just, you know, you know and everybody has a solution. I, I know that, and we got it fixed. I just want you to get it. You won't have to hit me at the door and tell me how to fix it, okay? So we'll, it, it's fixed. It's running fine now. But at the moment, man, I was mad. I was like, Matthew, are you kidding me? I said, do you not see, we've got clearly marked cans, not for mower, not for mower, not for mower, in magic marker on the can. How can you pour that in the mower? And he just was quiet. I said, I said just, just wait, I'm coming home. And I put the phone down hard, got in the car, I was mad. And I can still remember the, the traffic light that I stopped at. And I don't know why, but a memory flashed back in my mind. When I was about his age, Dad got a lawn boy lawnmower. Now, those were like the Cadillac of lawnmowers back then. And uh, we just had, and, and you had to have that gas mix in that lawn boy. And I poured straight gas in that lawn boy and seized up that motor in it too. And I remember my dad, I tell him my dad, and I said, I think I poured the wrong stuff. And I saw, you know, I could see my dad standing there, and he said, it's brand new. He said, it'll be all right. Oh, man, I was convicted at that stoplight. I had just acted so ugly to my son. He wasn't trying to be malicious. He wasn't trying to be disobedient. He was just clumsy, careless. And so when I got home, I pulled in and I walked in the door and I looked over to the right. And I had this, I have a king size recliner, good size one, you know, not, not for just normal people, people like me, you know. And he's sitting in this, his feet don't even touch the floor. And he won't look up, he just has his head down like that. And I said, Matthew, let me tell you something. He wouldn't look at me. And I said, when I was about 12 years old, Granddad bought a brand new lawnmower, and it had a gas oil mix. And you know what I did? I poured the wrong gas in it. And I could see just a little bit of a smile coming up on his, he still wouldn't make eye contact. And then I said to Matthew, you know what, Matthew? I think you're a whole lot like me. And with that, he raised his eyes and looked at me. And all was well, you know. Can we endure? Will our endurance allow us to maintain relationships when people are clumsy and say things that they shouldn't say and, and do things that they shouldn't do just out of carelessness, out of weakness, uh, clumsy? They said some horrible things to Job. They didn't want to do that. They didn't come there with the intent of, of just driving him into the ground. They came with the intent to help them, and they were just careless. I was sitting with a lady one time. Her husband had just, just passed away that morning. And as I sat there in her living room, there were people finding out, and, and they were bringing things. And this lady came over and brought something and was taking it on to the kitchen. And then she said, as she passed on to the kitchen, she said, um, I understand exactly what you're going through. I lost my husband a year ago. And that woman that just lost her husband went off on that lady. And in no uncertain terms, at a very high volume, she expressed to her, you have no idea how I feel. And I thought, you know, I understand our nerves are on edge and stuff, but that lady, came to help. She may not have expressed herself quite the way she should have, but it wasn't malicious. She was just a little clumsy. And we need to have patience with people who uh, are, are in that situation. A, a lady, another older lady said, the hardest thing, when my husband died, 
She said, the hardest thing for me is I couldn't get a moment to myself. I mean, there was a lady at church that wore me out. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't grieve. I couldn't cry. I couldn't. Every, she, she, 24-7. I mean, she's right there with me. And I just wanted her to go home. Again, she said, I understand she was trying to help. And she was patient with her. But it was thoughtless on the lady's part. She wasn't thinking that people need some time alone as well. But that's the kind of endurance Job had. Job was not about to let the clumsiness of his friends destroy everything and, to, and, and derail him as he sought to serve the Lord. Another thing about Job's patience is that he endured what he didn't want to endure. You think he wanted to go through this? Do you think anyone would choose this? If we had a list of possible outcomes in your life and you could look at the end before you lived it, I don't think anyone would choose this one. This is a life no one would want. Losing like he lost. He didn't want to go through that. But he did it. He endured it. And what helped him to endure it was his relationship with the Lord. He knew that that was at the end. That was what was at stake. I, I can't quit now because this would affect my relationship to God. Another story um, from my, my past that, that involves my dad. One, one day mom, I don't even know if mom remembers this. I remember it well, and I don't even know if we shared it. But one day um, mom was cooking, and we were having some kind of a steak or roast or something. I don't remember what it was. But she had burned it. Things were crazy that day, and, and she, some of the meat got burned. And she was crying in the kitchen because she burned the supper and stuff. And, and Dad pulled me back in their bedroom, and he said, Steve, I want to talk to you for a second. He said, Mom's had a hard day today, and um, she just burned some of the food that we were supposed to eat for supper. And, um, you know, this is, um, there's not enough to go around. So here's what I ask you to do. I want you to step up and, and be a man. And you know what men do? They, they let the women eat first. And so when the meat is passed to you, pass it on and just let your mom and your sister have that meat. Are you kidding? I was, yeah, I was ready to do, no, I was ready to do that. I was like, man, I just got an invitation to, to manhood here, you know, I, I felt. And, and so that, you know, when, when that food was passed around, I never felt more like a man when I passed that meat on, you know, and didn't take any, because that's what I was told men did. And, uh, you know, we, we ate, we managed, but uh, I still remember that to this day. Do you think I would have normally passed meat on to my sister and not gotten some for myself? I don't think so. I, I, you know, we would have been fussing and arguing about that one. But because of what was at stake, this is what men do. I wasn't going to give that up for this, for a piece of meat. And, and that's, that's Job. Job wasn't about to give up his relationship to God because of the events that he didn't choose for himself. He didn't like it, but what's at stake? I can, I can hang out. I, I can do it. I can hold on. And that's the way we ought to do it. Uh, there are things that are going to happen to you in life. If you've lived long enough, and maybe you haven't, but maybe you have, you're going to face things in life that just are not what you choose for yourself. Life is hard. No wonder, you know, when, when we've gone through some of the things that we've been through in the last uh, three weeks with death, it's no wonder that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that death is an enemy of God. I understand that more now. But um, endure, even when you don't want to. And then here's another thing he did. He endured in the midst of his own failure to understand. He didn't understand why all this was happening to him. But does an ounce of doubt 
have to destroy a pound of faith? Can Job say, you know what, I don't have the answer to this. This just isn't adding up for me, but I'm not going to let it overthrow my faith. I may not understand this, but it's not a faith-threatening deal here. Habakkuk couldn't understand how God would use a more wicked nation to punish a lesser wicked nation. And he said, God, I'd like for you to explain this to me. I don't get it. But by the time he closes the book in chapter 3, he says, listen, whatever you choose to do, I'm with you. I'm behind you. Uh, If the the grapes fail and, and everything just perishes and we have nothing to eat, nothing to drink, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That's the kind of determination we need. I may not understand everything about why things happen and why they happen like they do, but it doesn't shake my faith in God, and it need not. Because God is infinite in his wisdom, and he can see, and it's just a different perspective. And, and if you can understand, you know, a child... A parent and a child, there are relationships, there are decisions that are made that I understand fully that my children cannot understand. And if I can understand that on a limited scale, why a child should not eat dessert first, I get it. They don't. And it's just a difference in perspective. And if I can understand that, then why can't I just move it over a step and allow God to have a more infinite knowledge than and understanding than I have. It need not destroy my faith. And then I want you to consider this. Those are the ways in which Job expressed his faith. How do we get to that point where it doesn't matter what happens, we will endure? Let me give you two things real quickly and the lesson will be yours. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 24. I want you to see something that I think is significant from this chapter. In Luke chapter 24, there were, it was Sunday afternoon. Jesus had been crucified and resurrected. And there are two disciples leaving Jerusalem, walking on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus appears to them and says, hey, guys, what's, what's going on? What, what, why the sad face? And they say, Have you not heard? Do you not know what just happened? You have to be from out of town because you have to know about this man, Jesus. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was coming back to restore Israel, and then yet they crucified him. But now we are astonished, he said, because some women went to his tomb today, and they found the tomb empty, and and we're astonished. You know, the word astonished literally means we are beside ourselves. We know what that expression means. We still use it today. We're beside, you, have you ever been in a situation where you're just beside yourself? You don't know what to do. Something is so confusing, so bewildering, so uh, you know, you're just confused. You don't know what to do. And they said, that's what we are. We've heard. We thought he was the Messiah. Now we're here and the tomb is empty. We don't know what to think. We are beside ourselves. Life can do that to us. You can be beside yourself with grief. You can be beside yourself with loss. You can be beside yourself with guilt. Not knowing, how do I fix this? What do I, what do, I do? What am I supposed to do next? That's where these disciples were. And I want you to notice in verse 22, or verse 25 through verse 27, what Jesus did for these disciples who were beside themselves. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know what Jesus offered as a solution to people who were beside themselves? The word of God. It's not trite. It's a reality. God's word meets our needs. It helps us. You want to know how to deal with grief? Look at the promises of God. 
Look at his faithfulness. How can you not be comforted? You want to know how to deal with guilt? Turn to the Bible and look at how God will restore you and and use you once again in faithful service if you have failed. Every answer to life's question is found in Scripture. And Jesus took these people who were beside themselves and said, get back into the book. And that's the answer. You want to have a patience, an endurance that nothing can shake? Get in the book. The answers, the assurances, the security, the hope is in that book. And then I want you to think of this as well. Trust in the intended end of God. That's what James says, and I love that expression. He says, you know, the patience of Job, but the reason he endured was so that he could receive the intended end that God had in mind. God can make good of our lives. Romans 8 and verse 28 says, All things, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. I believe that. I don't know how he does it. It doesn't say that everything's going to be good that happens to us, but God can redeem no matter what happens to us. He can redeem it. He can fix it. He can make it well. He can make it work to our good. And that's a reason to serve him. I'd like to know that I'm not at mercy to the circumstances of life, that there's one greater than the circumstances that can redeem those circumstances and take care of me when no one else can. Man, that, that is valuable to me. The Bible tells us in um, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, as he gives the Great Commission, he says, I, I'm with you always even to the end of the world. He'll never leave our side. When my oldest daughter went to kindergarten for the first time and had to get on that big school bus, you know what I did? I followed her to kindergarten in my car, and I watched her get off, and then I went to work, and you know what I did at 2.30? I went back and followed her home to make sure she got... Nothing was going to happen because I was going to oversee it. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to endure because I know that I have a God working in my behalf who dotes over me and who seeks my good and when bad things happen has the power and the knowledge to redeem those situations. Why would I desert him? Why would I quit when I have those kind of promises? Job began with... 7,000 sheep. God promised him, I'll double your blessings. Everything that you had, everything that was yours, I'll give you twice as much. He began with 7,000 sheep. He ended with 14. He began with 3,000 camels. He ended up with 6,000. He began with 500 donkeys and 500 oxen, and he ended up with 1,000 of each one of those. But here's the kicker. He began with 10 children, and he ended with 10 children. That's not a doubling, or is it? Is that not a subtle implication of life after death? Did Job lose his children? By giving Job ten more children, did he not, in essence, double his children as well? He has 20 children, not just ten. God kept his promise. The intended end was to bless him twice as much as he was blessed before this trial of his faith began and God kept his promise. And I just want to encourage you that when life caves in around you, don't ever give up. Develop your own patience. Make it rival that of Job's. Allow if God were to ever write another book that that he might mention your name in it and say, have you considered the the patience of whatever your name is? Be patient. Turn to the scriptures for strength and trust that God has an end for you, an intended end for you that is consistent with his compassion 
in his love and his mercy. And we can be faithful. Our family, our hearts are heavy today. Um, I know it could be a whole lot worse. I'm aware of that. But one of the reasons that it's not worse is because I trust in the faithfulness of God and his promises. And I am going to endure and have more reason to endure to to that intended end of God so that I can enjoy a reunion that will never end. If you're here tonight and you're not yet a child of God, give your life to him. He'll work on your behalf. He'll bless your life now as well as throughout all eternity. If you're a child of God already but unfaithful and you're not in a relationship with him that would assure you that things would be well for you and for your family, one of the great things that my sister and I and and mom have is uh, the assurance and the hope, the confidence that um, it's not an end to our relationship with our father, with our husband. Um, It's a temporary separation. And that reunion will come about a whole lot quicker than all of us realize. Time, as I get older, it just goes a whole lot faster. I've noticed that. Um, If you don't have that kind of relationship with the Lord uh, where you can't leave your family with the same kind of faith and confidence, then fix that. Micah 7 and verse 18 says that God is a God who delights in mercy. He doesn't have to forgive our iniquities, but he does it because he delights in it. Why would you leave here lost when we serve a God like that? If you need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing.